Hey, welcome everyone to the latest episode of uh, Electric Podcast. Um, I'm joined here with uh, Seth Wintrow. How are you doing, Seth? I'm good. The weather's a little cold out there, Fred. Yeah, here too. Uh, and then that's uh, that's actually what we're going to start with today. <laughs> How the cold weather affected our EV experience this week. Um, myself, I had a, a weird experience with my Tesla. Uh, it's the first time that it gets this cold since I have my Model S. I had the this summer, so the winter is just starting here. And uh, yesterday we hit uh, some pretty pretty low temperature, talking about uh, minus minus fifteen yesterday. And I got this weird um, alert. Minus minus fifteen Celsius. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking. Fred, Fred, Fred you're in Quebec, uh, yeah. so there's a little we we don't play with, we don't play with your Fahrenheit the nonsense. No. no. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share the screen here for for the people that are watching. Uh, on the on YouTube, but I'm going to describe what we're seeing for uh, people that are audio only right now. So is the share screen working now? All right. Occasion window, just a second. All right. So if we look Actually. here. So that's the uh, when I open up my app, I see on the top of the um, range indicator that, that there's a, a little snowflake on it. We can see right here. And if you click on the charging tab, you end up with this here. So you see the snowflake again. But it's what's like more interesting? A, a snowflake in the alt right sense, right? Like you're just a little snowflake. <laughs> no, we're talking about a literal snowflake for people who okay. are audio only, and uh, well, literal um, the the general drawing of a, of a snowflake. But the more interesting part is the um, little blue uh, part of the range, which is normally green. Uh, indicated on the on the drawing of the battery, uh, you get that little blue part here, and what that that is, what we we learned it is, it's a part of the battery capacity that's not going to be able to use as long as the vehicle is not preheated. So unless I start preheating the vehicle right now, and uh, the the vehicle warms up and the battery just the the battery temperature stabilized, um, my Model S is not going to be able to use that range. So that was the first time that I I, I saw this, and um, uh, I was pretty curious because I've never seen it before, and I've never seen it from another owner either. And it looks like it starts at around minus fifteen because this morning I got that same uh, alert again, and uh, it uh, it was again around minus fifteen outside. So so I've never gotten that. I'm a little bit south here in New York. Mm -hmm. um, it gets. So far this year, it's only gotten down to about, I want to say Fahrenheit, about 15 or 20 degrees. And we also keep our cars in the garage. But um, in, in the middle of the day, we'll leave it out. So it's been below zero. I don't think you'll hit that at, at uh, freezing. But um, once you start getting, I guess, uh, you know, 15 below uh, freezing, you'll, you'll start to see that I'm assuming, uh, and and in years past, I've never seen that either. So that was kind of interesting. I think that's a new thing Tesla's rolled out this year. Um, I would note that that was such a small sliver, that little blue thing that um, you you know the part of the battery that you're not able to yeah, use. It's not huge. It's not huge at all. So I you know maybe if you go down to like negative fifty, that blue thing gets more significant. Yeah, I would assume so. But you still had uh, even even though. Um, when parked, yeah, your cars are in the garage and, and so forth, but uh, so they're not affected the range when they're charging or anything. But your your bolt had a, a pretty big effect. The the, the cold had a pretty pretty big effect on the, your bolt this week too, right? Yeah. So uh, the bolt normally gets about two hundred thirty eight uh, miles on a charge, and and I find that that's pretty accurate in the in the summertime. But as the weather's gotten colder, it's been creeping down to you know two twenty and then below two hundred. And uh, this week, for the first time, I saw a 240, I want to say 249, sorry, 149, uh, which is a huge, you know, that's a, you know, we're starting to get into like uh, Most on leaf territory. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the new leaf, actually. The new leaf, yeah. yeah. But uh, so, you know, obviously that's a little bit distressing because that's a pretty huge drop. Um, and, but the Bolt is a little bit more, uh, it, it uses a lot of your driving uh, recently into, into the math. And I'm always, you know, kind of gunning, gunning the Bolt. But also, um, I, look, I 
dug a little di- bit deeper into the uh, the stats there, and it looks like my last drive I had used uh, 30 percent of the energy I had used was for heating, and another percentage, maybe like five or three or five percent, was conditioning the battery. Yeah. So a full third of the range was had nothing to do with propelling the car. Um, I don't know how I did that. I mean, you know, I had the heat on, but uh, and I did start the heat before I got in the car, which also conditions the batteries, much like the Tesla. Yeah. But uh, I was kind of surprised at 149 as the range. That's a huge drop. And I, I wonder yeah, if, if it takes that into account, if it takes the fact that uh, uh, you're, you're not adding any mileage and you're breathing at the same time. Because I, th- I think the bolt takes into account uh, one drive starting from a charge, right? It's it's between charges. That yeah. Takes account. So if um, if you were breathing after after a full charge, then yes, I think uh, uh, I, I think that may have a big effect on it. Yeah, and you know, there's there's a lot of other things like I, I you know, uh, the tires make a huge difference uh, in your range. And a lot of people put snow tires on in the winter. Right. On the uh, on my Model S, yeah, we talked about that last yeah. week. I think. Okay. Did, did we? Yeah. So yeah, we talked about that last week. Uh, so but I, did, I, you, you said you did for you. You did your, uh, your 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 with winter tires for your Model yeah. X, but did you for the, your Bolt? No. So I'm looking at doing oh. that for the Bolt because the Bolt's tires are like ice skates. They they yeah. slip they slip on dry. You know, if there's a little gravel or if it's just slightly wet, they slip. And that's a combination of, you know, it's it's a pretty light car overall, especially for tires are super low, run, so they have no pretty much no great tread. And, mm-hmm. of course, electric engines have instant torque. So you throw those three things together, and it's kind of hard to keep those things on the ground. Um, I think that's one reason why... Tesla went to a mostly four wheel drive uh, lineup. Uh, you know, it's obviously way better in the winter to have four wheel drive. So, uh, you know, we're a little concerned, you know, with, with the kids and everything. Uh, we want to make sure uh, everybody's safe. So um, we're, we're putting Blizzax uh, on the bolt uh, okay. probably uh, this week or next. Um, just, you know, just to be safe, but I imagine that that's going to be another drop in in uh, Efficiency. range. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be interesting. I wonder, forties. Like, am I going to hit a hundred or something? Is that going to be like I'm going to be driving like a, a, a real compliance car at that point? No, I doubt we're going to get that bad. But uh, um, we're going to move on to the next story because we just had an almost breaking story right now. If you if you go to Electric, we just posted the. Uh, that Tesla introduced a new uh, supercharger fair use policy. Uh, so we know they've been there have been a lot of changes to the supercharger network uh, over the last year. Not not only talking about more stations coming online, but uh, actual change to the, the policies to how to use a charger, like the idle fees that were introduced um, last year. Then there were the the end of the free unlimited access that. Uh, sort of is sort of being rolled out gradually since you can still have access to it if you buy through the referral program and so forth but right now there's a sort of a, a bigger uh, update to to that policy so they're not they are not calling it the, the supercharger fair use policy which is um basically you cannot use a supercharger if you're using your car for a commercial purpose uh, and that includes a, a lot of things so this little listed Taxis, uh, ride-sharing uh, services like Uber, Lyft, and any other service, commercial delivery and transport of goods. So that will, I would assume, that would even include um, what uh, Bjorn does does in, uh, in Norway. So for his Tesla road trips, you you, you always use them with. Uh, uh, I forget the name of the app, but there's an application that lets you uh, uh, sort of a ride-sharing for moving stuff. So that won't work either. Uh, any government purposes and any other commercial venture. Now, the good news is uh, people are grandfathered into the supercharger policy right now. So 
it's starting today. So any new or used car, but today cannot access the supercharger network if it's used for commercial purposes. That's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, you know, we know about Test Loop in, in the uh, Los Angeles to Vegas territory, but there's a lot of uh, Uber of uh, people using uh, Tesla superchargers. I, I actually in um, in Albany at the, uh, the supercharger there, I met a guy who had retired and he said he was driving Uber, driving his Tesla as an Uber driver uh, to pay for his Tesla. And, uh, you know, the the, the model where he gets to charge for free and and obviously you know people are really impressed with his Tesla. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good was way to, how he was kind of, yeah it's a good yeah, way I mean, to introduce people to the to the technology too if you just get him in a ride and you get that start talking and everything right and you're kind of an evangelist I mean you know electricity is still cheaper than gas so I don't know if he's going to be screwed but um, you know he was obviously in a really uh, good position where he was paying nothing. Uh, yeah. And getting 100 percent of the profits on the or 100 percent of the uh, revenue. Yeah, they're they're not screwed. We talked to uh, last year to the first Tesla taxi in North America, which is a guy um, in um, Quebec City, uh, who bought his uh, small his small S in 2013, I think. And uh, the guy is a full time taxi driver, made that his main car, and used it his only car, I think, actually, and uh, used it for work. But uh, so use it in Quebec City in 2013, and there, there were no supercharger there back then. I think the the, the first one, the closest one, is now in, in Levy, which is just the other side of the Saint Lawrence River. And but that that came up came online uh, this year, so he, he's been using it successfully with just home charging all the time. So uh, well, of course, uh, in terms of uh, electricity rates, Quebec is not maybe the best example. So it's, it's very cheap. But uh, I'm sure um, other services like that uh, not going to be too affected. Anyway, they, like I said, they're grandfathered, grandfathered in. But um, it's still a pretty pretty big update because uh, we, we just reported yesterday about uh, the um, uh, the biggest uh, Tesla taxi fleet, which is in Amsterdam. They do the uh, between downtown and the airport. They do a shuttle there, and they have a fleet of over 150 uh, Tesla vehicles. Uh, and they, they were just seen updating their fleet yesterday, so they started putting a used vehicle for sale. So maybe they knew that uh, that the change was coming, and they, they started updating their fleet before uh, today. And that's why they are now uh, just now selling the used vehicle. Just speculation at this point, but it makes sense with that change coming. So you want to lock in as many vehicle under the supercharger, um, uh, under the free supercharger policy in order to take full advantage of it. But then and you look at uh, what Tesla is actually charging for the supercharger uh, without the unlimited free access, and it, it, it's still a fair price uh, compared to what you're going to see on the paid third-party networks like uh, EVgo and such, which can be fairly expensive. And, um, I don't know. Do we have any question about the new supercharger fair use? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, how will, how will it work? Uh, you know, if you are an Uber driver, can you just go to a supercharger and say, hey, I'm Ubering. I want to pay for my electricity now because I, I need it quick. Um, it's not that I don't want to pay for it. I just need it fast and I can't get that electricity refill at my home very fast. Yeah, that's a good question, because if you look at the actual policy on Tesla's website now, it's available on their legal page if you guys want to look. And uh, it, it says any supercharger. It really likes, it looks like a blanket ban for uh, commercial use. Um, so maybe Tesla just doesn't want to deal with uh, the um, paying system. Uh, are they going to charge you for, for the use uh, if they know whether or not you're using, using it for commercial use? But yeah, it will make sense to still give them access, but have them pay and use that money to expand the network. And if they take too many... Uh, charge point at a specific station, but open a new station near uh, near there, or add the uh, add charging stalls, uh, using that money that uh, those those um, Uber or whatever other commercial use that the uh, um, th that's taking a lot of um, of charge time at those station. But what they're saying instead is that they're gonna offer charging alternatives. So we don't know exactly what that means for now, but we we did see uh, Tesla sell um, private privately owned supercharger that don't doesn't show on them on the supercharger map 
to to private fleet. We have one here in Montreal because there's a there's a growing uh, Tesla taxi fleet in Montreal with uh, a company t called Teo Taxi. They're building up a, a fleet of just electric uh, taxis, and those include Tesla, but also some Leafs and some uh, uh, Kia Kia Soul EV. And do you know how those work? Like, uh, you know, if I pulled up my Tesla Two One, could I charge there, or or is it kind of blocked? Is it blocked physically, or is it blocked yeah, software wise? Yeah. yeah, I think it would need to be blocked physically. I think you could just pull up and, and charge with with any uh, any Teslas. Uh, I assume, but uh, the the idea behind it is that you you don't know that it's there. If, uh, it's normally, when you you go to supercharger, either you know you, you know it's there, or you use the map within your Tesla to. Uh, to go there, and it doesn't show up on the map. It's it's privately owned, but uh, we know too that it's not the ideal solution because the one that we saw, uh, we talked to an owner of, a, of one of those station at one point, and Tesla locked them at sixty kilowatts. So it's not a full one hundred and twenty; it's half the capacity of a regular uh, Tesla supercharger station. So you, you're locked at sixty kilowatt. Let me just tell you too. So, no, so it's it's sort of a normal supercharger. But instead of uh, the 120 kilowatts being split into two stalls, uh, and if one is not in use, you can get the full 120. Both are locked at 60, so it's not ideal if you're looking for a quick charge. That's interesting because well, you could, I mean, you could get a 50 kilowatt uh, Chatamo and get pretty close to that that charge rate. Yeah, sure. But really um, yeah. So the one in Montreal, I think it's twelve stalls, so it's pretty pretty significant charging um, charging station that they have there, and it's just for the Teo taxi fleet. Uh, I, I think it's for the one that's operating from the airport. So, and uh, we knew about a few others like that. Uh, there were there was one in uh, in Sweden too for um, just uh, the owner of a property that was com and was a Tesla owner, and he had a property where he wasn't satisfied with the supercharger network in the area. One in his own, and Tesla actually sell them to uh, to him. So they, they, there are solutions out there, especially if uh, you're looking to to buy a large fleet. Um, we we even uh, heard of uh, Tesla making deals like if you buy uh, 10, 10 vehicle for fleet, Tesla doesn't do discounts as um, most of you probably know. You just you don't do discounts, but uh, that was uh, like the first discount they introduced is if if you buy ten vehicles for commercial fleet, uh, you get two uh, of those private supercharger uh, uh, LaTeX 60 kilowatts uh, for, for the use. So uh, we, we've heard of a few deals like that, well, at least a few offers of, of those deals. Why do you but think they uh, locked it at 60? Do you, do you think it's a safety thing or a, a, a rights thing? or I don't know. Maybe because they don't want someone building their own network. Like, oh, yeah. If you can actually get the hardware from Tesla, I could just decide to uh, build out because you, you can do whatever you want with those uh, if you want to charge people for, for, for uh, charging there. So if you, you want to use them at, at your work or uh, if you if you own a property where it makes sense, because normally Tesla, if you, you're a property owner of a business or so, something like that, Tesla will try to push you to use the destination charger instead. And for that, they will pay for everything. They will um, they, they, they will pay for the, the actual hardware. They will pay for the installation. They even pay for um, a standard uh, 1772 uh, G1772 uh, charger. Uh, one, may maybe even more than one. Uh, we we we've saw a few example of that too. So, if they want to push you that there, but if you have the opportunity to have an actual supercharger to business, you maybe it's more attractive to to Tesla owners and uh, you get more traffic or something like that. Or you can even charge them maybe for for the service. Then, uh, but if it's only locked at 60 kilowatts. Then you, you might as well just take the free charging station because uh, we heard those are expensive. <laughs> you, you can get yeah, them free for, for ten fleet, but uh, yeah, I mean, just putting them in, you you need to have uh, some pretty crazy uh, wiring coming into your building. Yeah, uh, you need like yeah, you need three phase, four eighty, crazy stuff. Yeah, here. Here I think it's uh, like the latest one that's coming up in, in Laval here near Montreal. Uh, they were talking about uh, needing a new transformer, a 900 volts transformer to uh, um, to supply the um, the new station. So it's huge hardware we're talking about, huge expensive hardware, not ideal. 
Yeah, and can you imagine what the uh, the, the Tesla Semi trucks are going to need? Uh, hardware yeah. wise. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, that's one of the commercial use. Uh, I finished my article with that. That's uh, Tesla is trying to deter the commercial use, but uh, they actually going to have their own network for commercial use with the mega charge, the mega charger, which is, I think, now the name of the uh, of the new station that uh, are going to be able to charge the Tesla Semi. So um, that plays into um, into that new policy too, I think, because. Um, while they're trying to completely separate the commercial use from the supercharger network, they're going to have their own commercial use mega charger network. And uh, it wasn't clear yet um, how those are going to be deployed or, or are they going to be deployed at supercharger station? And they're going to have uh, just a separate part where semis are going to be able to park and, uh, and charge or are they going to be at completely different locations? Uh, no idea about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, you know, I imagine they'll they'll probably look like the current rest stops on freeways, where you have the cars go this way and the trucks go that way and whatever. But you know, we don't know. That's that's a really yeah. good question. Well, that's why I think that's uh, that's not going to be priority right now for the Tesla Semi. So we can we can use that to uh, to move to another um, uh, another topic for the week, which was the Tesla Semi and the, the competitors coming up. Um, and uh, so last week we reported that the orders for Tesla Semi are starting to blow up and uh, there's a snowball effect coming and uh, a lot of people are, are reserving the trucks right now. But most of those people are, uh, most of the people, most of the companies reserving, they, they operate their private fleets, they have their own distribution network and everything. There are not that many freight companies right now ordering the vehicle. So it's going to be a lot easier, I think, for those companies like Walmart, like Lobos, um, like PepsiCo last week, uh, that have their own distribution network and the, their routes are, are planned and they don't change much. And they're going to be able to deploy uh, the mega charger or whatever Tesla's going to sell as a, as a charging solution at those um, locations, so distribution centers and customers, instead of having to deploy first a, a large network between. Um, big center so to allow like long distance travel basically like the supercharger does right now for the owners but for tesla semi that's a bigger en endeavor to, to go into a bigger venture to uh, try to deploy those station and have the, the required powers at those specific in between big cities and, and, and uh, popular um routes for for travel but deploying that as a at the walmart distribution center then a walmart star store and having that the, the trucks go there, that's a lot easier for, for Tesla and for those customers. So I think that's why we're seeing those uh, people with reserve first. Yeah, and, and you know, the use case that uh, Elon Musk talked about on stage was, you know, you, you pull in the truck and while it's loading up with stuff, it's also being charged. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the use case they're thinking of. Also, you know, you have 500 miles. So theoretically, most trips aren't aren't going to be that long. Yeah, they also plan for to be able to just go to 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 your customer and come back without charging. So that's useful for freight companies. But you you cannot expect a freight companies to just assume that his, his customer is going to have um, a charging solution at the location when uh, signing a contract. So for freight companies, the contracts they, they go quick and they have to put in rates and and be competitive. So they have to take account those rates with the charging so that's that's just a mess with uh w w with charging technology but the uh, captive fleet is the market for the tesla semi right now and now it's as some competition we have the um we saw the the tour that was a popular article this week when we published the, the tour truck which is a startup uh, based in los angeles that unveiled their their, their prototype this week which is like a, a sort of a frankenstein uh, uh, prototype since they, they're using existing chassis from existing trucks and um, axles from just off the shelves and, and stuff like that. But uh, they are focusing on the, the battery tech technology, like a lot of startups are doing in the uh, EV world, to just own their battery technology, the battery IP, and put that in whatever vehicle that they can come up with. And uh, I, don't I think know, that's going to be rough. Way? Yeah, well, what did you, without even, we're going to go in the spec in, in a second, and it's going to, 
sounds stupid, but uh, before even the specs, without thinking about the specs, what do you think of the, the design of the truck? You, you see that truck with the big uh, grill in the front? I, it's I, you know, I I think they should be trying. Like I'm glad that uh, different companies are trying, but it just doesn't seem like that Tesla's design is going to be surmountable. Like it just seems so much so far ahead in in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it's it's hard for me to imagine a an upstart coming in. And, you know, with no experience in the charging network with, you know, Tesla's got obviously very optimized batteries, very optimized motors. They've been doing this for a decade plus. Uh, it, it just, you know, doesn't, doesn't feel like we're going to see uh, any competitors. To me, I mean, it's, it's similar, I guess, in a way to like the, the Model X competitors that are coming from, uh, you know, Lucid and, and Lee Echo and like all the, all the, you know, like, you know, here's our prototype, but, and then, you know, it's not quite as good as the car that Tesla's already got on the streets. Um, so I kind of feel like it's going to be the same thing in trucks where, you know, they have these things. Uh, we, uh, we've, we looked at orange. Um, they have these trucks that kind of run around, uh, yards. Like, I'm go, yeah, yards. Then we go like, 50 miles, which is good. I mean, don't get me wrong. The more EVs, the better, like full stop. But it just like none of these things seem anywhere near as exciting or as revolutionary or as disruptive as Tesla's semi. Maybe I'm, you know, clearly I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah, but, well, uh, you're not yeah. really drinking Kool-Aid if you just take it for face value what uh, Tesla released in terms of spec and what uh, Tor Trucks released this week. So just to make things clear. Uh, to make things clear, uh, they're talking about they're both talking about a class eight, 80,000 pound capacity trucks on both sides. But uh, Tor is talking about $150,000 for a truck with 100 miles of range, and um, Tesla is talking about 150,000, so the, the same price, same capacity for 300 miles of range. And Tor plans also a 300 miles truck, but it's a hundred thousand dollar premium, so it's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the 300 miles range. So they're hundred thousand dollar difference for what will have to be the same, uh, roughly the same cost of operation, assuming that uh, they they, had, they can they can achieve a, a powertrain as good as Tesla, which is of course a big assumption. But um, yeah, so no, uh, it, it doesn't make sense. So they, they, they could be mistakes on, on both sides, like that. Tesla, maybe Tesla got their numbers wrong. Maybe uh, Tor uh, is right on with, with their numbers. But uh, coming back to the design, because I, I thought the design was so uh, a big fail here, because with the, the huge grill at the bottom, which has to hit the aerodynamics of the of the truck quite significantly, and uh, I think. A, a big part of why Tesla is able to achieve those those specs is the aer aerodynamic of the of the Tesla Semi, which is uh, far better than anything uh, coming close to industry. A lot of people don't know exactly how they achieve those those, uh, the, those aerodynamics performance either, and uh, that's a big um, question mark on the Tesla Semi right now. So, if, is it true that they achieve those um, uh, the, the drag coefficient that they were talking about? Which what was it was a uh, like 30 uh, 31 it was like, it was like 0.3 something which was better than a bugatti Viren. yeah so that's a big part of how efficient the tesla semi is and uh i i think that might be why uh the tour is not able to uh to come up with anything close in terms of of, uh, of range uh with uh, a battery pack because also on the battery packs yeah we talked about this last or maybe a few few weeks ago the battery packs like don't make sense financially right now. Yeah. So we kind of think that there's some sort of uh, cost improvement that Tesla is factoring in to their calculations. Um, I think I read somewhere that they're looking at about fifty dollars per kilowatt. Uh, is that right? No, fifty. Yeah, 50, whatever that um, typical per kilowatt hour. Fifty dollars, um, which, which would be kind of nutty because right now everybody's trying to get to a hundred. So that would be mm -hmm. a factor of three in three years. 
pretty pretty crazy. Yeah. So, and we have to. Assume... We're gonna. Yeah. Go ahead. We're gonna get crazy. Yeah, and we have to assume though that uh, those battery pack improvement and costs are should trickle down to uh, this other sort of lineup of vehicles too. Right. So th that'd be uh, that'd be interesting. And speaking of uh, cutting cost, uh, another thing that came up this week, uh, today actually, uh, Tesla introduced a new, um, a cheaper next gen uh, mobile connector. I don't know if you saw that earlier today. Tesla... Yeah, this is actually a big deal um, because typical EVSEs, uh, good ones, are over 500 bucks. Like, uh, you know, we, we like the juice box from e Motor Works, um, Aerovent. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Air Environment uh, makes a turbo cord again, uh, pretty bucks. Yeah, five hundred bucks base charge points over five. And there's GE Siemens um, Clipper Creek is another popular model, but the thing that these all have in common is they start at like five hundred bucks. Like I think we ran a, a a deal from nine to five twice the other day, where an old one that was like a 20 amp or 25 amp one it's going for like 350 and that you know because it was discontinued to to have like a brand new uh EVSE you know Tesla quality with you know all this the the adapters for the 1450 NEMA like together for 300 bucks is kind of nutty no. like uh again I I I don't know how they get there with the price especially you know Tesla being premium um, we postulated on the uh, the post that you did, Fred, that um, Tesla is actually able to save uh, significant money on uh, this product because uh, they don't have to pay Menkes, which is a German company that I believe uh, has a patent on the, the J1772 uh, uh, paddle design, but also the the software handshake that goes on between the car and the and the charging station, I think um, Tesla can bypass that. Um, they don't have to pay for that. So, I mean, really what you are doing, I mean, it's an extension cord with a little handshake. So yeah. why does it even cost 300 bucks? Why doesn't it, you know, it should be like, what does an extension cord cost? Like 50 bucks tops. Well, so uh, it's a pretty good extension cord though. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very nice extension cord, but in reality, it's not changing the current at all. It's not making, you know, it's not changing DC to AC or AC to DC or, you know, raising or lowering yeah, that's the voltage. The at all. Right. Yeah, so that, it's because we're, we're just talking about the mobile collector right now for, for Tesla, which is the one that comes with the car. $300 as the if you buy it separately for an extra kit or or, or for whatever reason, you, you need a, a second one. But if we uh, compare it more to the, the Tesla wall connector, which is um, what, what you'd buy normally for for your home, if unless you want to just use a, um, a NEMA, uh, just the, the regular NEMA plug for 240 volt and use the mobile connector. And that one starts at $500 uh, for a Tesla. So that starts at the same level that the, the other um, charging connector starts, um, but Tesla's wall connector is capable of 80 amps. So that's what you need to, to, to compare then, because if you compare those other competitor to the Tesla wall connector at 80 amps. Uh, I I haven't seen much for anything less than seven seven fifty. Don't know about you, but uh... no. In the U.S., I mean, um, in Europe, I think there might be some vehicles that do uh, uh, they do a little bit more uh, amperage, but in the U.S., nothing even comes close. I mean, I think Tesla is the only thing that does 40 amps. I think the Chevy Bolt 32 amps. Uh, the Ionics, 32 amps. Um, so, I mean, Tesla's the only only thing out there right now that even will accept, you know, it has an onboard charger that goes over uh, 32 amps. Yes. And uh, and they go, you know, the, the standard, the, the old standard is 40 amps. The new Model X standard is 48 amps. And then if you buy the duals, you get, I think, 72. Is that right? You can still buy the, the, the dual for the Model X. I'm not sure that you can. I don't know. Uh, I think um, I think you changed that earlier this year. 
so now it's it's all standard that uh, uh no Pretty. i think or no the yeah i think it's standard at 48 and you, you have to buy the the 100d for um uh the 72 i think that's the, the new standard that sounds right anyway so with what my question was is when you buy a model x do you still get the, do you get the new adapter, which is only 32 amps? Because that, well, that would on be... the website they said that uh, now it's it's the second generation adapter for all vehicles. But that's the other thing. To the 32 amps instead of 40 was just for it said it was just with the adapter. So, but uh, huh. with one one of the two adapters, oh, I'm not sure which one was it. Um, because I would be a little bit upset if I had a Model X that charged at 48 amps and and it only came with an adapter that charged at 32 amps. I yeah, mean, you would 14, still probably 14, get a full charge every night. 1450, uh, the Nemo 1450, that's... Uh, the way they make it sound, it's only lock at 32, 40, 1450. So if you have a 515 plug, you're okay at 40 amps. Uh, it's, not, it's not clear. And we'll find out more soon. I'm sure we can call uh, a service center and they'll they'll escalate it immediately <laughs> um nonetheless it's uh it's fun to see the slow because uh, the other option is still available you can still buy it on the on the website but that's their second generation so it's the new one and it's cheaper and you might have a lower charge rate uh we're gonna have to look into that but in other news this week uh, we had a big article on the auto dealer uh, communication in Michigan. So Tesla is still uh, on in an ongoing battle, legal battle in Michigan to get the right to sell its vehicles directly to the customers, to its customers. So we've been following that legal battle pretty pretty closely over the last year. So I, I think yeah, I think it's pretty much uh, a year ago uh, to the day, or to the month at least. Yeah, that, uh, that Tesla sued uh, the state of Michigan, and uh, yes, yeah, they yeah, they ahead. tried they tried uh, you know negotiating and they tried a bunch of other stuff and they I think Tesla was just like you know what we're not going to get anywhere this way, uh, you know I think the politicians in Michigan were just already bought and paid for, so to speak. <laughs> uh, so the the only recourse that Tesla has in Michigan, which is strange because. I, I find any state that doesn't allow Tesla to sell its vehicles really strange. I mean, this is an American company trying to sell green cars that, you know, don't, don't pollute the environment for, you know, they're just trying to, to sell vehicles. And because of this and antiquated set of rules, a, a lot of states and, and, you know, obviously politicians are being paid off here. A lot of states don't let them sell. So, you know, Michigan's obviously... Not only do they have the fossil fuel lobby to contend with, but and the auto dealers, but they're also competing with Chevy, you know, GM, Ford, uh, whatever, Fiat, Chrysler. Yeah, because that's an um, interesting part. They don't want. Yeah, they don't in, want them there. Yeah, in the lawsuit, Tesla actually cites GM as part of the problem. So no, normally, and because Tesla had those lawsuits, or maybe not necessarily lawsuit, but uh, uh, public communication with uh, with. Politicians and uh, and uh, local uh, DMVs in, in several states uh, about those same issues, and most of the time it comes down to Tesla versus the the local uh, auto dealer association. And a few other occasion, uh, automakers try to to get involved, or or at least the lobbying group for the automakers. But most of the time, it's all the auto dealers, which are, are technically there's Chinese wall, separate entities, and everything. But in in the case of Michigan. Uh, Tesla cited GM as being uh, behind the effort to, because the, the problem was the, the 2014 law that was changed at the last minute uh, with adding a few words that uh, clarified that automakers cannot operate dealership in the uh, in the state. And now Tesla sees that as a, as a commercial um, uh, co commercial law violation, and they say that the auto dealers and GM pushed the the change in the law. Uh, uh, to be uh, anti-competition, basically, and um, so right now we're, we're we're still we're a year into the the lawsuit, but we're still stuck in, um, in the discovery process and what information can be used in the in the lawsuit, 
and, and so forth. So earlier this year, it was about uh, the uh, the communication of the uh, of the lawmakers, two lawmakers involved in the um, in making that change. Oh no, excuse, excuse me. One one uh, was involved in making that change. Uh, Joe Yoon is the senator that introduced the last minute change that 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 confirmed the ban for Tesla. Uh, so Tesla tried to get all the communication between him and the auto dealers uh, to see what how that came to be how because that guy didn't add that ID on his own and uh, decided to introduce uh, um, the, the change it doesn't work like that so someone was yeah I, yeah I mean it's pretty clear and I yeah. think in a previous uh, state lawsuit maybe it was Indiana neighboring Indiana um, GM was implicated and in, and in lobbying against That's right so this that is not Indiana. Yeah, this is not unprecedented. In fact, it's yeah. likely that uh, this communication is going to turn up some some sort of lobbying effort by but, parties, uh, probably related to GM or you know well, other right other. Now it's mostly the auto interest. dealers. Uh, we we haven't seen much evidence about GM, but I'm sure it's going to come up later. But that guy, that, uh, that that senator, is his own wife is a lobbyist for for the call dealership. So. That that doesn't yeah, to, to start with, but the other um, lawmaker that was also subpoena for uh, for his communication with uh, the dealership, uh, and the reason why it was subpoena was the, uh, he, he, according to Tesla, the uh, he's not a senator, he's a representative uh, in, in Michigan, uh, Jason Shepard, he told one of Tesla's representative that. Uh, um, then I'm quoting here, Michigan auto dealers and manufacturers don't want Tesla in Michigan. So we, the Tesla tried to make the point that uh, the lawmakers knew the real reason for, for, for this ban on their excels and it's coming from auto dealers and automakers. But right now the news this week is that we, we got uh, our ends on the um, on a new uh, court order for from a judge when uh, because Tesla tried to they went with the lawmakers first and now they were trying to get the information directly from the auto dealers and three specific auto dealers uh, Han Harbor Automotive, uh, Sierra Automotive and Shanine Ch Shanine Chevrolet uh, a Chevy dealer whatever and um, so those uh, those auto dealers tried to appeal to the disclosure of the information because they feared a backlash if the information became public. So um, they tried to argue that uh, it would impede on their capacity to lobby if their uh, lobbying communication were made public or at, uh, not even made public. Because uh, right now it looks like we won't see directly any information from those communication. It will be lawyers' eyes only. But the good news for Tesla is that uh, the judge uh, shut them down and said uh, uh, that uh, the communication are important to uh, to the lawsuit. And furthermore, uh, they said, uh, I'm quoting here, uh, when they're trying to, because because those auto dealers are not being sued right now. Tesla is suing the state, it's suing the governor, it's suing the, uh, I think the DMV. So it, it, it's suing the government. It's not suing the, the auto dealers. So the auto dealers are trying to um, act as bystanders that are they, they have nothing to do with it uh, and everything. But what the judge uh, wrote, and I'm quoting, but particularly unique to this case is the evidence that despite despite their status as non-parties, the dealers are not merely bystanders in this case, given evidence that the automotive dealers themselves drafted the anti-Tesla law to the Tesla situation. Accordingly, the communications sought and discovery are directly and highly relevant to Tesla's claim. So the judge seems to, to confirm the fact that uh, uh, there's strong evidence that, oh, is that, okay, sorry, that was a weird sound. Um, the Tesla, uh, so he seemed to confirm that there's evidence that uh, the, auto, the auto dealers are behind it. So that was, was big news for Tesla this week in their, in their fight in Michigan. So that's an interesting uh, scenario. I I, uh, I hope that they get some really juicy stuff. Is it hopefully it'll influence other uh, states to kind of cut it out? Likely, it's probably not going to be that interesting. I, I'm assuming. 
Well, uh, the, the the one with the lawmakers, I think, uh, would be more interesting because the the more vehemently defended, like tried not to disclose anything, and they even went as far as citing like comments in our articles and uh, online about what we were writing uh, about the lobbying effort and, and, and so forth. So uh, it'll, they they tried very hard not to disclose those information. So there's probably something uh, behind it, if you if you ask me. Uh, yeah, what? so uh, I just just to move uh, forward, I, we didn't put the, the link in there, but um, there was a Continental, uh, which is a German uh, OEM parts maker uh, announcement this week, and they're going to be at CES uh, next month. Um, but one, one little piece that I found interesting is that they, they say in their press release that their uh, charging system will work with all chargers. And, and obviously, my question is, is it, it's really going to work with superchargers? And I emailed their, their people this week, and they said uh, nobody, nobody got back to me. But it it's kind of reminds me of ChargePoint last year when uh, they were like, hey, we have a Tesla uh, handle for our, our charger. Yeah. And uh, that got shot down like by PR, and, and all of a sudden, we went there the next day, and there was absolutely no sign they took it of off. Yeah. related. So um, I kind of feel like this Continental news is going to fade away. But it would be interesting if Continental did um, make a, a charger, a car capable of charging at superchargers. We still haven't heard anything. You know, supposedly, uh, Tesla supercharger patents are open and, and anybody can create a car that's theoretically could work with Tesla superchargers, although I don't know behind the scenes if that's uh, that's realistic or not. Yeah, uh, we heard that a few times before you mentioned ChargePoint with the event last year, but uh, also Porch, uh, Porch said that uh, their new 800 volt system is going to be compatible with Tesla. So we they, they said that, but they don't say how because it doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, as far as we know, there's, there's no 100 volt system that compatible with Tesla right now. But uh, then later on, we found out that they were using CCS, and Tesla is part of the CCS consortium. And uh, there were rumors in the past that they will try to offer an adapter for CCS. So it's not out of uh, um, of the possibilities that uh, it's going to happen. But right now they're just claims, and uh, you're better off bidding on the on the supercharger system uh, to charge your Tesla. But the other big news and uh, recurring news this week, we reported a few few different articles on it, is the Tesla Model Three production. Of course, all eyes on uh, on on those, especially for the uh, hundreds of thousands of reservation holders out there, uh, trying to see when Tesla's going to achieve uh, volume production and deliver the cars. And the, the biggest uh, good news for, for those reservation holders this week was the um, a, a, a Tesla supplier in, in, in Taiwan, uh, HOTA, I assume it's HOTA. Um, they make gears and axles, and they are um, they, they are a Model 3 supplier. They, 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 in the, they are in the, the Model 3 vehicle program. And the interesting thing is that they, they were the, the first one to, um, to start the alarm uh, on the Possible delays in the in the ramp up before Tesla confirmed it uh, uh, in the earnings call last month, and they were the one that said that they they had their orders slashed from uh, five thousand units in December to two thousands, and uh, sure enough, a few days later, later Tesla confirmed the news. But right now, the uh, they, they break the silence again, so because suppliers are not supposed to talk about that stuff, but uh, they ended up um, disclosing it uh, in, in Taiwanese uh, media that uh, they are back to 5,000 in December. So according to them, Tesla changed their uh, production schedule back to 5,000 in December. In December, And they, they even had to uh, mobilize the whole company and, and get over time and ship by air instead of boats and everything in order to comply. That's pretty so big that, news. That's, and Yeah. And so so but, what, what we're saying is that that curve that uh, Tesla has where it's ramping up. It it's more like a baseline than five thousand. Yeah, that, that's the thing. What it's kind of it's looking. not happening. It's not happening because uh, like 
they are able to do it actually they, they, they didn't they didn't offer to say it but uh they, they said that actually they, they took measures to do it to to uh, increase the production again back to the previously announced five thousand per week level but there are hundreds if not thousands of other uh, suppliers that have to do the same thing so uh it's encouraging that Tesla, if it's if it's confirmed, that Tesla doesn't comment uh, on the production right now. So we're only using the words of the suppliers. Um, if it's true, it's a, it's good news that Tesla changed their guidance back to five thousand. But it doesn't mean that they're gonna hit five thousand this month. It's this month because I, again, they just changed the guidance. So all the suppliers have to comply right now. So there might still be uh, delays in hitting that that number of five thousand per week. But uh, Elon said last month that um, they were still aiming for a few thousands per per week this month. So that's more achievable, I think, right now. I, I wasn't sure about it a few weeks ago, but now we're seeing a lot more deliveries um, for the Model 3. There were hundreds of vehicles spotted in Fremont, in the delivery center in Fremont, uh, several dozen more in Los Angeles. And all over the US right now, they're, they're, Elsewhere in the U.S., we're still talking about uh, employee deliveries in, in, in service center and stuff, but there were a lot more uh, of that lately too. So there, there are those. Then there are more bigger volume deliveries in, in California, uh, regular customer deliveries starting. So we're seeing more deliveries. Then we're seeing this coming from um, from the suppliers and skating that Tesla is, is, is working through or already done with the bottle next. And then uh, we reported also earlier today that Tesla again sent an, a new batch of uh, uh, invitation to configure your Model 3. So that's good news too, because the pace of those coming going out seems to be accelerating. The first one was the week of the 21st of November. Then it, it took another two, three weeks to uh, uh, send a second one. And since then, we, we've seen a regular um, rollout of those invitations. So uh, it looks like Tesla is ready to, to deliver those in, in higher volumes, if you ask me. Yeah, and we're starting to see more uh, inventory at the uh, Fremont factory. Uh, we've seen images and drive-by of, uh, you know, just like hundreds of uh, Model 3s in parking lots. Um, you know, at the delivery center in Los Angeles, we've seen uh, th those numbers grow as well. So it, it does seem like Tesla's ramping up, maybe not to their, you know, what they wanted to, um, but it does seem like it's 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 happening you know like uh, the people who are at the beginning of the line may actually get their stuff this this year um i'm kind of giving up hope now because uh the lead time is pretty high yeah uh, and we have 15 days left so but the good news is wow. that it looks like the uh 15 000, or the 7500 dollars is going to stay in the uh the federal budget um Although, like, if Tesla's selling all these cars, they're going to run out of budget here pretty soon. So, uh, or they're going to run out of 7,500s and go to drop down to the 3,750s. Yeah, but, but uh, you're, I think they're they going to be good for next year, though. It, it, yeah, if, they, they have two quarters after. Yeah, if uh, it stays in the budget like it's supposed to right now, at least that was the latest information, uh, you're going to be okay for, for the federal tax rate next year with your, at least your first. Uh, Model three, if you decide to go with uh, your, your your two reservations. Well, I think I'm going to go with the the base model, which isn't due until the beginning of 2018. And beginning means like the first half, and the first half means probably like June 30 30th. Yeah. So we had, we had a question. Uh, if I choose that, yeah, we had a question from J John's yeah. Denison's. Uh, have any deliveries been made to non-Tesla employees? So yes, we heard that those deliveries started uh, this week. We've even reported on a, a very special one, uh, but that one was actually um, uh, delivered earlier than it, it should have based on, on the, the customer's delivery window. But there were uh, very special circumstances uh, because the, the um, reservation holder in question had that they stage four cancer and it was, uh, it's, we're talking about terminal cancer was given a, a three to three to four month prognostic. So I posted on the TMC board and Bonnie Norman, who's a, a kind of a prominent uh, uh, figure in the Tesla community, a long time owner back from the Roadster and everything. She's active on the on the forum boards and the, on social media and everything. She saw the post 
and uh, tried to arrange for him a, a test drive. So the guy was said that on his bucket list, he wanted his Model 3 before he, he died. Um, and while Bonnie didn't think she could deliver that, she could at least uh, get one of her contacts who already got a, their, their Model 3 to give him a, a test ride, the test drive. So that happened uh, a few weeks ago. And after that, she, she pushed really hard to uh, with Tesla to, to try to get uh, an early delivery. And Tesla made it happen. And then the guy even had a, a, a private walkthrough with um, John McNeil, president of uh, sales and, and service. And he got his, uh, his Model 3 uh, well, um, earlier this week, I think Wednesday or something like that. That's a great so that was a, yeah, n n that was a real Tesla non Tesla employees, non Tesla employee priority um, delivery, but it was a priority uh, <laughs> terminal cancer delivery, if you will. Right. But we uh, we hear of, of of more people getting a delivery schedule this week and uh, in the coming days for uh, without a, a, a special employee delivery. But this week was also the SpaceX employee. So with the um, with the new uh, the new delivery center opening in Los Angeles, um, in, in Marina del Rey, pretty close to the SpaceX headquarters, a lot of SpaceX employees started getting delivery this week, and those did have a sort of a little bit of a priority, or at least they were able to reserve sooner than uh, than most people. Yeah, uh, Cedric, you notice my hat. Yeah, I, I'm I'm wearing my boring boring company hat right now. Yeah, not, not not that many news about the boring company this week, other than the their ever growing hat sales, going thirty thousand strongs. I, I think right now I, I'm one of them, as you can see. But there were there was a news today uh, about uh, about uh, the boring company though um, that was kind of interesting because um, they were moving forward with uh, their their tunnel on the east coast uh, between Baltimore and um, and Washington D.C. But that project was first introduced as an, an Hyperloop project between DC and New York. So we're not just talking about a, a tunnel and uh, an electric rail system inside that tunnel. We're, we're, we're also talking about uh, a pressurized um, pump, uh, air pump system to remove the pressure from those tunnels and uh, put an Hyperloop system inside. But right now, the uh, the news today was that uh, the, the the first uh, the first permit were for the excavation and the and the tunnel between uh, DC and Baltimore. Um, the company uh, was gra was granted those uh, those permits, and the information inside pointed toward uh, just an electric skate system closer to what Tesla is uh, is proposing right now in Los Angeles and uh, and maybe in Chicago too. So. Um, it looks like it might not be exactly part of that hyperloop. Uh, we know that they actually need to develop that hyperloop because uh, Elon said that he didn't want to use um, the same system that some of the other startups are developing right now. We've been reporting a lot on the uh, uh, one who was going to say hyperloop one, but they changed their name to uh, Virgin hyperloop. Virgin. Yeah, with hey, you know it's kind of possible, I guess, is that maybe you know you don't build, you don't get permits for a hyperloop. Because, like, I'm sure that's that's like theory at this point. It's not. Oh even, yeah, mm, that's good. And that's you just point. you just get get permits for tunnels, which I think people kind of have an understanding of. And then you uh, once the tunnels are built, then you then at that point you've been working on the homework to get the uh, the pressurized yeah, tunnel permits. Exactly, because uh, they could actually just build the electric skate system and then depressurize the tunnels, and it's basically what an hyperloop is at, at this point. So that's uh, that's yeah. not impossible. But uh, the, the the good news, so that was a weird part of the news, because uh, we, we're not we're not sure how the electric skate system plays into the hyperloop system that uh, they're planning on the East Coast. But the good news was that they actually plan to start digging next month. So a few months back, we uh, we posted images of the, um, the staging area. They already added staging area on in, in Maryland, now they plan to start digging as soon as next month. And uh, Elon said a few months back that they bought a second, second boring machines, those huge boring machines. So uh, sounds like that machine is going to to the East Coast, and they're gonna have simultaneous West Coast East Coast program to to, to start digging and work on the on the the, the boring technology. 
I think that's pretty much it for today. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the one other thing that we might just quickly talk about is the uh, quote uh, that uh, Elon Musk gave at the AI conference and then was picked up by uh, Wow. But uh, he was against public transport, and I thought that was kind of interesting because you know we've we've talked behind the scenes about how you know Elon Musk's dream is a kind of California for the world where everybody is East Coast people are all you know in trains and and mm -hmm. buses and whatever. Um, but it sounded like that quote was taken out of context, and uh, Elon was quite upset with Wired and. Uh, and uh, even uh, called a couple people idiots that were <laughs> on, yeah. that, on that uh, Twitter chain. Yeah, it was pretty mad so, uh, for that. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, sound so, like you talked about before because uh, the his vision is because he, he believes in autonomous driving and, and so forth. So of course, if you believe in autonomous driving, that if you well, everyone believes in autonomous driving. Is the question is more how soon it's gonna it's going to get and uh, how safe it's gonna be and, and everything. But if you believe in that and you believe in uh, in ride sharing, which is quite evidently becoming a big part of transportation right now, then you believe in autonomous ride sharing. And if you believe in autonomous ride sharing fleet and you add electric to the um, uh, to the equation, you get very, very low cost of uh, cost per mile of transportation, uh, door to door, so destination to destination, and uh, of course that's going to affect uh, public transport. So the big advantage of public transport over um, right uh, on autonomous ride sharing feet is traffic. So it's public transport reduce traffic a lot. Oh, we know that we know that trans public transport is great for reducing traffic. So that's I think that's a big part of the boring company that uh, uh, Elon is trying to to um, to add to his uh, vision uh, for Tesla is that a Tesla network, which is Tesla's idea of uh, electric ride autonomous ride sharing, uh, it's gonna increase traffic for sure. If uh, everybody's gonna have their own car to get in and uh, automatically get there, it, it, even if those cars drive better, it's gonna increase traffic and. That's I probably what he doesn't like about public transport. I think that's that's more the context behind the um, behind the quote. Yeah, and he also doesn't like sitting next to serial killers, but that's uh, sitting guess, next he's, to he's, killers in the yeah, traffic. That was part of his quote. Supposedly, is like you don't have to sit next to a serial killer. Well, there, there's no the doubt. End. There's no doubt that ride sharing is is more convenient than uh, than public transport. So no one can argue with that. Really. I I think I think he's you know pushing his, his vision. Some of his uh, he's pushing his vision. But the quote was taken out of context. Clearly, he was upset about that. Yeah, um, we probably he was trying uh, to make a joke too. Like he, yeah, exactly. People take things way too seriously. He, uh, and we we do it at electric too. We 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 write uh, just to to know if Elon is joking or not. So, uh, like a good example is sending his, uh, his his roadster to Mars. Like we were discussing it in the newsroom, in Electric's newsroom before uh, before posting. It was like, is he joking? Is he not joking? Is he joking? Then we we got the confirmation from a source that uh, it, it wasn't joking. So we went ahead. But uh, it's hard. Sometimes you think you're writing yeah. an article about. Uh, a joke that he's making is pretty much what happened at, at Wired, but he took it like for more seriously than they should have. Anyway, thanks for okay. being with us with this uh, latest installment of the Electric Podcast. And um, now we are on haul. We are on haul your favorite podcast app for the audio version only, and we are trying to improve the audio quality too. So uh, let us know if uh, uh, if you see an improvement and you have any free feedback uh, in that regard. And um, Otherwise, the video is going to be on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we're going to see you next week. 4 o'clock Friday Eastern. Bye.